Hey everyone, Matt Brunig here. I had a piece in Politico earlier this week. The piece was titled, Before Slashing Social Security Cut 401ks. The argument of the piece is pretty straightforward. Uh, basically, I say, look, everyone, every few years, people are talking about how we need to cut Social Security, how we're, it's going to run out of money, and you know, we need to cut benefits for elderly people in order to save the program, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And then I observed that it's weird that we're always talking about cutting Social Security, but no one ever talks about cutting the other parts of the retirement system. Uh, you know, Social Security is maybe half of the retirement system. I mean, depend on exactly how you want to measure it. But we've also got these defined benefit pensions, defined contribution plans like 401ks and individual retirement accounts. There's also life insurance annuities, uh, though those are relatively small, so I didn't really include them in this piece. Um, and, you know, you know, I, I just kind of say it's just weird, you know, that we don't really talk about this. You know, you might think that reason we don't talk about this is because, well, those are private and this is public, but that's not really true. If, if you count all the tax breaks and stuff for these programs, it's like half a trillion a year that these, uh, this other system is being subsidized, um, so, you know, uh, to give a comparison, Social Security benefits uh, for the whole program is like a trillion a year in outgoing benefits. Um, that's kind of an apples to oranges comparison because when we talk about the costs of DBs, DCs, and IRAs, we don't cost them by how much benefits they pay. We cost them by how much tax breaks they uh, rely upon. Which is, a, you know, it's a little bit apples to oranges, but whatever. It's still half <laughs> of what we're spending on, on Social Security and the way we normally account these kinds of things. So the piece just kind of goes through and says, you know, what's, uh, the, you know, just kind of speculates that the reason we don't talk about this other half of the retirement system when we're talking about cutting benefits is because the other half of the retirement system is skewed towards the rich. Um, and I get some numbers from the CBO here. Uh, the CBO says that the top fifth receives 58.1% of all these subsidies, uh, the about half a trillion discussed above. Um, and the poorest fifth only receive 1.3% of them. Even the middle fifth receives 10.5%, which is about half of what they would receive if all this money was distributed evenly. So, you know, it helps the rich. Uh, the, you know, this is kind of the, the, the parallel retirement system for the affluent, you know, disproportionately. Um, uh, the other thing is that th this sort of private system just generates crazy fees for bankers and financial intermediaries because they have to run these accounts and they're all asset based and all that kind of stuff. I didn't pull a number for this, but it's a lot. Um, and so... And then the final kind of part of this is just to kind of give a concrete example of what you could do. So right now they're talking about let's raise the retirement age to 70. I already have a video about what that really means. It really means cut benefits by like a little over 20% across the board, regardless of when you retire. A lot of people think, think, think that that means that you can't retire until you're 70. That's not really true. So security re retire anywhere from 62 to 70. But the full retirement age, that like placeholder is, uh, it kind of makes, deter determines what your benefit level is going to be at any one of those uh, ages that you retire. So anyways, it's basically just like cut all benefits by 20, 23% or something like that. Um, and so what I say is look, look, the CBO says that's going to save 121 billion over the next eight years. Um, and then I just take, um, the assets that are held by the the other half of the retirement system, right, which is thirty four and a half trillion of assets, and I say, what would it cost? What would you need to tax those assets by in order to generate one hundred and twenty one billion over the next eight years? Do some very simple math there. Determine that it would take about a, a tax of about zero point three percent. 
So, you know, the point here is not to say let's let's do all this. It's just to say, look, if you want to start cutting old age benefits, if you think, man, it's really dragging us down. Well, let's start with the DBs, the DCs and the IRAs. Let's not start with Social Security. Social Security is, you know, kind of the fail safe for low wage workers. You know, it, 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 it benefits everyone, but it's really hugely beneficial for low wage workers. This is basically the retirement system for higher wage workers. So let's cut that if we're going to cut anything. Um, and I just kind of wanted to, you know, play with people a little bit on this, you know, 0.3% is, is, is such a low amount. Um, but people get upset when you say, well, let's start <laughs> taxing these assets because they say, well, I put the money in this account on the assumption that that would never be taxed. And so aren't you betraying me? And then, of course, you come back and say, well, don't you think cutting Social Security benefits is betraying people who had subtle expectations about what the Social Security checks might be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways. Um, and, you know, I mean, as far as pieces go, it, it went well. It actually went very well. Tons of shares, tons of reactions. I got lots of emails. Um, and, you know, I got like in terms of, you know, influence, I got, you know, here's Richard Phillips. He's the pensions and tax policy director for Bernie uh, and, and on the help committee, which Bernie chairs. And he shared it and did his thing, you know whatever right like nothing will come of this but it's part of the think tank game and i'm influencing the people i'm trying to influence i guess sort of whatever what i wanted to do in this video though is i wanted to kind of walk you through where we get this number because it's a cool resource that i very few people i think actually use um Certainly, uh, people who write now, I mean, people in the financial sector and like uh, traders and stuff like that, I think they use this information. Um, but I don't think that you see a lot of people who are kind of trafficking in the economics, like blogging, writing, journalism thing. I, I think they're sometimes, they don't really access this either because they don't know about it or, or maybe they're intimidated by it. But anyways, let's jump into it. Uh, this is where I get that data, and I'm going to show you some interesting things you can get from here. It's it's the Z.1 publication. I don't know what that means. Um, uh, these days, they call it the financial accounts of the United States, but back in the day when I first learned about it, it was called the flow of funds, uh, which they still include here in the subhead. I learned about this publication actually from Doug Hinwood's Left Business Observer. So I don't know if you know who Doug Hinwood is, um, but you know back in the day he wrote the book. I think it's called Wall Street: How It Works and Who It Works For, or something like that. I think it's out of print. You, you maybe go find a you know secondhand copy somewhere. Um, he used to have this thing called the Left Business Observer, which is sort of. Uh, you know, lefty, really, uh, you know, spreadsheet socialism style writing, if you will, uh, before that was really a thing. Uh, you know, he was an early internet adopter and all that kind of stuff. He he suspended that, I don't know, maybe 10 plus years ago, but I used to receive it and, and I was quite, you know, it, there was nothing else really like it that I knew of um, at the time. And he would frequently cite to the flow of funds. And I was like, what the fuck is the flow of funds? And eventually I figured out, oh, it's this thing from the Federal Reserve. What's going on in here? Um, anyways, for that specific piece, uh, maybe I should go back. So what is the flow of funds? Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like, <laughs> are you interested in capitalism? Are you and when I say are you interested in capitalism, I don't mean are you interested in like kind of culturally posturing as as interested in capitalism and critiques of capital. I mean, like, are you are you really interested in capitalism? <laughs> you know, not artistically interested in it, um, but just like deeply, deeply, do you want to know what's going on uh, with capitalism? This I think is sort of like. The, the 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 key to everything it's it's essentially well what is it 205 pages of tables that just map out where all the assets in the economy are how many there are of what type who owns them who owes what debt to who who owes who owns what equity from what company i mean it's just 
it's unbelievable. Um, and you get both the level of ownership uh, in any of these things, and you also get the flow of ownership. So how, how is ownership changing every quarter? Uh, how is debt how is this particular, like, like auto loans, how did they change last quarter? And who actually owns auto loans? Who's the beneficiary of auto loans? Like, on and on and on. Um, and so, I mean, let's see how, like, the best way to look at it is they kind of break these tables down into two uh, sections. You have sectors right here. And y you'll just go into one of these sectors and they'll give you this kind of like balance sheet of all their assets and liabilities, very detailed. So if you want to see, like, what are the assets and liabilities of non-financial businesses, you would go to table L102, which is on page 79, and they'd have it all listed there for you. The other thing you can do, and these sectors just go on and on, right? These are not minimal sectors. The monetary authority, by the way, this is the Fed. So if you want a quick glimpse into the Fed's balance sheet, you can go right here. Uh, the Fed keeps uh, separate, uh, more detailed uh, things on its website. But I mean, you know, we got life insurance companies, we got pension funds, money market funds, mutual funds, government sponsored enterprises, real estate investment trusts, REITs, uh, holding companies. I mean, any kind of like entity that owns assets or may have liabilities, they kind of aggregate it all together and you can just see it all. Um, and then they'll also do it by instruments. So you notice the sector ones all start with one, right? So this is, you know, table 120, F120, table L120. And then the uh, instruments all start with two. And the instruments are just the specific asset. So you can see what assets a particular sector owns, which is this one. So kind of go sector by sector, or you can just look directly at the asset and say which sectors own those assets and what amounts. Does that make sense? And these things are all like able to be cross-referenced with one another. It's it's really it's it's quite elaborate um, and interesting. If you're curious about farm mortgages, how many how much farm mortgages how many farm mortgages are out there and who owns the farm mortgages? Um, I don't know. Um, Anyways, for this piece, I go to this table, table L117. So L means levels, F means flows. So levels is going to be, flows is how, how the values change from one quarter to another. Levels are the level like right now, like how much total, you know, assets or liabilities exist right now. Um, and so we start here, we go to private, private and public pension funds. And let me uh, let me move my face. All right, let me bump this up a little bit. Not too much. Um, and what I'm looking for here is I want to know really the total amount. Now, if you go down, there's a there's some lines here at the bottom that really kind of drive it home here, right? So we got household retirement assets, right? And they actually explain it here. Household retirement assets in tax deferred accounts, including employer sponsored pension plans, IRAs, Roth IRAs, and annuities. Like I said, I didn't include annuities in my uh, piece. Um, anyways, they say that we got $40 trillion of household retirement assets, and they're broken out this way, right? We got these four kinds of assets. So this amount. We got 17 trillion in defined benefit plans. We got 9.3 children in defined contribution plans. 11.6 children trillion in IRAs, and then we got the 2.9 trillion in annuities, life insurance annuities. If you add up these four numbers right here, it'll get you this number here, right? Um, what I did was I took uh, these numbers. And if you notice, they have this other line here, pension entitlements. So you notice pension entitlements here, this number is the same as this number, right? So a pension entitlement is going to be how much a particular household is owed from a pension that they participate in. And this is all like mocked up for present value and all that kind of stuff, right? So this is how much they are owed. But how much they are owed is not necessarily the same thing as 
how as the assets of the pension fund because the pension fund is also able to pay out pension benefits from future contributions and blah 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 blah. So what I do is I take this number and uh, well I, I really what I do is I only take the part that's funded by assets. So you see here funded by assets. 10 trillion. That's my kind of rough approach to it. So we essentially take the 40 trillion here and then we knock out this here. That gets us, you know, 34 and a half trillion. That's the number I use in the piece, which I actually think did include this. Um, and I may have used a different, you know, you can use different numbers from different years, from different quarters and stuff like that. But yeah, that's basically what I did. And then you can also go back in time and you can see how this number varies. I think I determined it increases by a certain percentage each year. And then I projected that out and blah, blah, blah. So pretty straightforward. But it's kind of cool. Like you can actually go into this and they publish this every three months. And you can actually see how where these assets are. What are the retirement assets? What do they look like? Um, so... That's that for what I did for the Politico piece, but there's some other interesting things that I thought I might just hit on here for fun. Um, so at the very top on, pay, uh, on table B1, uh, they have this derivation of U.S. net wealth. So if you've ever at wondered to yourself, how much wealth is there in the U.S.? Like total aggregate wealth of the U.S. as a nation, as a like national entity. This is one approach at measuring it. I'll show you a slightly different approach uh, that might actually be more interesting to you. Um, but this one is interesting because if you look at it, what do they do? They add up households' direct holdings of non-financial assets. So the non-financial hel assets held by households, which they break out into real estate, equipment, IP products for nonprofits. Households usually also include nonprofits, right? So kind of everything in, in, in the society is in some ways ultimately owned by households um, or, or governments. But there's also this third entity, which is like trusts and these like nonprofit organizations that are not owned specifically by a person, but they still have assets. Foundations work like this as well. So they kind of get grouped in with households typically. So when they're saying households here, they really mean households and nonprofits. And by nonprofits, they don't just mean like do-gooder orgs. They mean basically these other pools of capital that technically don't have an owner because they are like foundations or trusts or whatever. Um, but look, notice they're only counting the non-financial assets of households. So they're not counting any of the equity or debt or anything like that. It's just how much non-financial assets. Um, and non-financial assets, I mean, they have it listed here. It's equipment, land, consumer durable goods, things like that. Um, financial assets are things like stocks and bonds and, and debt and whatever, right? And they just do that for each of them. So for non-financial, non-corporate businesses, the reason they do non-corporate business here is because if it's a corporate business, it would ultimately show up. Uh, well, no, that's not true. That's not true. Excuse me. I jumped ahead of things. So they just add up the non-financial assets of all these various sectors, right? The domestic corporations, non-financial assets, the non-financial assets of the federal government, which is they, they put it at $4.3 trillion. Um, this excludes, but notice it excludes lands and non-produced non-financial assets, which is actually going to be very hu huge. The federal government owns a ton of non-produced non-financial assets in the form of land, which is not picked up here. The non-financial assets of federal governments. Okay. So we start here, right? And why do they only count non-financial assets? The reason they only count non-financial assets is because the idea here is that financial assets and liabilities are all offsetting internally to the U.S., right? So um, I might have a, I have a liability in the form of a mortgage, and that mortgage is an asset for someone else. It's an, I guess, 
initially an asset for a corporation that owns the mortgage, but then is really an asset for whoever owns that corporation. But at the end of the day, these things are offsetting. It's a liability for me. It's an asset for someone else. It all equals out. And the same thing would be true for equity and all the rest of it, right? So the idea here is that the non-financial, the financial assets all offset. Another good example of this would be government debt, right? If the government borrows, that creates an asset uh, in the household sector or whoever it is that buys the treasury bond, but that creates a liability for the government. And so these are seen as like offsetting, right? So if the financial assets are all offsetting, then really we just should look at non-financial assets, the real stuff, you know, not the paper claims, but the real stuff, the land, the buildings, the durable goods, the equipment, inventories, you know, uh, IP products, I don't know. Is that really non-financial? So we take all the non-financial assets, but then we still have this, the, there's a question of, okay, all the financial claims that exist internal to the U.S. are all offsetting, but the U.S. has financial claims outside of the country, and then other people who are outside of the country have financial claims that go inside the country. So we need to figure out the net of that in order to get net wealth. Now, this I always thought was very interesting when I first read it, so... If you take U.S. financial claims on the rest of the world, so these are the financial assets that Americans own that are abroad. So a good example of this would be in my retirement account, um, I am like uh, invested in like an index fund that owns uh, equity, that owns bonds and equity outside the U.S., right? So they'll own shares of European and Asian companies and they'll own bonds of European and Asian companies. I don't even know what it all is. It's Vanguard and they've got it all set up, right? So if you add up all of that, all the stuff that Americans in their financial accounts, they have financial claims abroad, it gets you $24 trillion, right? So Americans own $24 trillion worth of financial claims abroad. But foreigners own $40 trillion of financial claims inside the U.S. And, you know, I, I don't know what you want to make of this ultimately. I mean, it's, it's ultimately a function of the U.S. trade deficit, um, our export-import balance. I, I get all that. But it's, it's kind of funny in the context of certain people who think of, of the U.S., you know, as this hegemon that's uh, sort of siphoning from the rest of the world. Like, realistically, you know, the, the rest of the world has a bigger financial claim on us than we have on it. Again, that's due to trade imbalances, but that's where we are. Um, so, on net, we, we, we owe a net, you know, $16 trillion dollars to the rest of the world, or, they, or the rest of the world has a net financial claim on us equal to $16 trillion. So whatever. You take this figure, the $131 trillion, which is just our non-financial assets that we have in the U.S., and you subtract the net financial claims the rest of the world has on the U.S., um, and then that gets you... Um, that gets you... Well, wait, no. Anyways, that's how you get the total... Um, net wealth here the net wealth. this one is already sorry this one has already subtracted this out so if you don't subtract this out it's like 147 trillion of uh non-financial assets and then you subtract the 16 trillion to get to the 131 trillion so that's 131 trillion of wealth in the u.s by this measure now there's another measure here which is household net worth and this one, I think, is perhaps more relevant and more interesting uh, to people. I think I've got it here. Yes. So uh, this one, uh, you can, you got to go all the way down to uh, page 144, <laughs> B101.h, balance sheet of households. Um, they, this one uh, publishes at quite a lag, as you can see, a whole, a whole year lag. Um, but this one is interesting because you get some... Uh, they're, they're taking households as a whole. They're looking at their financial assets or non-financial assets. So you kind of get it all broken up, which is, which is neat, right? So overall, the U.S. households, all U.S. households put them together and at the end of 2021 had nearly $160 trillion of assets combined. Non-financial assets were $42 trillion 
of that 159, so less than a third. Real estate, you know, your home was 38 trillion. So this is an interesting insight because so many people will talk about, well, the home, the home is really the source of wealth. The home is the source of wealth for Americans. Not really. 38 trillion of 160 trillion. You know, that's less than 25% or right at about 25%. The other 75% is not the home. Now, of course, what people mean by this is they mean, you know, sort of middle class and that, that sort of thing. Uh, but the middle class doesn't own the wealth of the nation, right? They own little, little bits and pieces, including their homes. But the great majority of the wealth is held at the top of society. And this can kind of drive this home. Because for a lot of people, they'll think, oh, well, my house is such a large percentage of my, of my assets, especially. Not, this is not home equity, mind you. Right? This is not home equity. Home equity is the value of your home minus the mortgage you owe. This is just the value of homes. Right? Um, so <laughs> the value of homes is, is, is like a fourth of, of, the, of the assets that are, are held by households. Consumer durables, that's going to be things like furniture, stuff like that. And then we got financial assets. That's where the real money is. The real money, 114 trillion of the 159 trillion are financial assets. We got checkable deposits and currency. This is going to be stuff that's in your checking account. We got time deposits and short-term investments. Uh, this is going to be stuff in uh, like um, certificates of deposits, uh, I think savings accounts as well, maybe. Um, money market funds, debt securities. Um, so, you know, ownership of government bonds, loans are pretty small. Corporate, here, here's where you got the big, in some level, the big stuff, right? Corporate equities and mutual fund shares. This is the corporate equities and mutual fund shares that are owned directly by households. Um, so it's not going to include um, like retirement account stuff. So that's 42 trillion. So right off the bat, just directly held, directly held equities and mutual fund shares exceed home value. But then we got the pension entitlements, which are a little bit overstated again because some of that's unfunded and whatever. Wait, we just went over that. But if you bring in the pension entitlements, you know, now we're talking about, you know, I don't know, a little less than half, you know, vastly exceeding real estate value. Um, and then you got equity and non-corporate business. This is going to be people who own, you know, their own companies or whatever. That's fifteen trillion, um, and so on. So, you know, there's a there's a chunk in real estate. Um, there's a chunk here that's just kind of held in checking accounts and saving accounts and whatever. Uh, the real money is going to be right here. You know, is going to be corporate equity mutual fund shares, pension entitlements, which are themselves typically held in corporate equities and mutual fund shares, and then equity in uh, business. You know, the old, old school capitalist notions of ownership of business uh, as being where the money really is. Liabilities, the households ha have about $17 trillion of liabilities, and they'll break that down pretty nicely for you here. So, 17 trillion liabilities just means debt here. So U.S. households collectively owe 17 trillion dollars of debt. Um, 11 of those 17 trillion dollars is mortgages, which you know I don't know. It's an asset back debt. It's it's not a huge deal uh, typically. Um, then we got consumer credit, um, which I'll go over in a second. We got these other things which are pretty small. But it's pretty much mortgages and consumer credit. Um, and that, that pretty, so what is consumer credit? And this is one of the lovely things about this uh, PDF is anytime you find a line on it, on one of these sectors, for example, and you want to know what the hell is that, because they also have tables for each kind of asset or instrument, as they call it, you can just find the table for that instrument and get more clarity on what exactly consumer credit is. So they're saying that consumer credit is $4.4 trillion. That's how much households owe in consumer credit. If we switch to this table here, L220, L222, we get the consumer credit stuff broken down. Um, and we can look at the memo here. 
Um, this was the year we were looking at, 44308. See, so it matches up perfectly, 44308. Lovely. We know we're in the right spot. And so what were we talking about here? You go down in the memo, and you can see it pretty clearly, right? You got uh, auto loans, which is 1.3 trillion. You got student loans, which is 1.7 trillion. And then you got credit card loans, which is 1 trillion. That's pretty much what consumer credit consists of. The rest of this stuff, uh, other consumer credit, you know, is going to be, I guess, things like personal loans, stuff like that. Um, but the big ones, cars, student debt, and credit cards. Um, Anyways, you put it all together, and this is the net worth. In 2021, this is the net worth of U.S. households, $142,000. Excuse me, $142 trillion. Um, and so one thing, I've actually wrote a piece, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal a long time ago where I pulled this number. And so one thing you're, I'm always curious about is, okay, what what it what would it be like if you took this 142 trillion dollars of assets? What if it were distributed evenly across the population? Um, you know, I don't know. Just get a kind of sense. And so I did that here for a number of years. Um, so this is the year we were looking at. Um, I think I can, yeah. So uh, net worth per capita. So this is the population of the US in the relevant period. So we take the 142 trillion and we divide it by the 332 million population and we get net worth per capita 426,000 per person, 427,000 per person. Um, and so for a family of four like mine, that'd be 1.7 million um, if we had an average amount of wealth. Like if all wealth were like evenly distributed, my family would have like 1.7 million uh, sort of an asset value uh, to our name in some sense. Uh, we do not, in fact, have 1.7 million or, or really anywhere close to that, um, which, you know, just kind of goes to show you how, how uh, skewed the ownership of this wealth is. Like I, I don't think most people realize just how like it, that that an average four person family if everything were distributed evenly would have 1.7 million dollars of assets i don't think people i think most people would find that quite surprising because your median family maybe has like a hundred thousand dollars of assets 120 man it might depend i haven't looked uh we're gonna have new data on this out uh soon but you know, the median and the difference between the median and the average is, is quite massive um, because, again, the wealth is held uh, primarily at the top. Um, what else have I got lined up here? Um, oh, as a last one, uh, this one I always think is interesting. Um, so, you know, you hear about government debt, you know, the federal debt. People are all upset about the federal debt. You can actually see who owns the federal debt here. Um, on table L210, Treasury Secretaries, uh, Treasury Securities. Sorry, it's very late here. Um, anyways, total assets. So total assets, you know, if you go to the part that's assets, that's going to tell you who owns the debt because to them it is an asset, right? So total assets, $24 trillion. Um, uh, notice there's a discrepancy between total liabilities and total assets. That's uh, kind of strange, and they actually noted here that there's a discrepancy. They just, you know, they can't get the numbers to add based on their two data sources. But um, who owe, who owns the federal government's 24, tr this $24 trillion of the federal government's debt? Um, and the answer may surprise you. So first things first, the monetary authority owns five point. One trillion of it, which is about twenty percent of it. The monetary authority is the Federal Reserve, so in a sense, this is intragovernmental debt. It's not. It's not real debt. I mean, the Fed. You know, depend on how you want to think about the Fed, but you know, I, I I would say for the most part, just don't really count that as as real debt, right? And and so the actual number is nine nineteen trillion. So this happens a lot if you hear these big numbers about the debt. Um, they're always a little bit weird and off. And one of the big ways that they're off is they'll often count this as if it's real debt. Or they might also count the debt that's held by the Social Security Trust Fund, which is also technically a treasury security. They'll count that as real debt. 
that's owed by the federal government. This one doesn't actually count the Social Security Trust Fund that way. Um, but all that stuff is intragovernmental, so it's, it's kind of silly to count it that way. Um, anyways, so we got $5 trillion is held by, uh, by the Fed. The next big uh, holder... You know, and then you just kind of, it's just kind of held by a bunch of funds, you know, private pension funds have $421 billion. Federal government pension funds have $2.5 trillion. State and government pension funds, uh, $366 billion. Money market funds, mutual funds, you know, it's just a lot of funds that people, you know, own and invest in. These funds are ultimately held by households for the most part. Um and we also have this line. This is for uh, holdings that are direct. So this is something that, again, might confuse people when they're initially running through this. You should say, whoa, so households only hold $1.7 trillion of the $24 trillion of outstanding federal debt? That seems weird. That's how much they hold directly. So you have to like directly go buy the bond on like the Treasury website or whatever. Households typically own these debt instruments through these pension funds or money market funds or mutual funds, you know, things like that. The final note here is about uh, the rest of the world. So this is people outside the U.S. They hold $7.2 trillion of our debt, national debt. Now, these days, if you want to cheat a little bit, you can use uh, the distributional financial accounts that the Fed puts out. They've kind of made it easy to capture some of this stuff with some graphs and stuff, but definitely not in this level of detail. Um, and the thing we're noting here is this data is, in many respects, uh, projections, especially the newest data. Like, you know, a lot of that is, especially the distributional component of it, it's, it's modeled. It's not like directly collected information. They model it. You, you know, there's a whole paper explaining how they do it, but uh, it's, not, it's not quite as real as the data in the, this PDF is. Um, so... I mean, you know, as you can see, <laughs> I've actually spent a lot of time just browsing this. You know, it's kind of, again, if you're interested, really interested in who owns what, what does wealth look like, how, how, is, how are assets really structured in our society, this is it. This is the key to it all, really. Um, the only last thing I guess I'd note on this is that there was actually a point... Um, when I was doing this, when I, I realized that um, I was reading this and I, was, I wanted to see, hey, let's, let's look into agency and GSC backed securities. And when I was reading this chart, I happened upon this paragraph here, this little footnote that says that they include TVA bonds. TVA is the Tennessee Valley Authority, right? And I was like, oh, wow, I didn't know the Tennessee Valley Authority had its own bonds that it issued i had no idea that's kind of cool um and that really is what led me down the rabbit hole to eventually writing this piece fighting climate change with the green tennessee valley authority one of our papers um it genuinely came from me reading this footnote and learning that the tva issued its own bonds and I was like, oh, that's cool. If it issues its own bonds, then it could kind of use that to expand. It just needs a little congressional authority to do that. And as those uh, who have paid very close attention, which is probably none of you over the years, Bernie Sanders actually adopted this proposal in his 2020 presidential campaign. So it all started here. It all started in me <laughs> scrolling these tables of numbers and just kind of trying to figure out how everything works and what all is owned and by who. And then learning that the TVA of all places actually issues its own special TVA bonds and then writing this paper and then Bernie adopts it and it becomes a platform item on his 2020 presidential campaign, second place in the Democratic primary you know um again what did it all amount to i don't know but from a think tank 
a think tank perspective, that that was an effective uh, thing, I guess, that was accomplished. Um, you know, I was I was I was think fluencing, and I have the financial accounts of the United States to thank for that. And really, ultimately, Doug Hinwood's left Business Observer <laughs> because he it was that that turned me on to all of this. So, anyways, I don't know if this is interesting. It's interesting to me and maybe gives you a little bit more insight into how I do these things. Um, and there's got to be at least a handful of you. I try to think like, in a way, maybe I am Doug Hinwood now <laughs> to some other people who are watching this and then they will, you know what I mean? Like there was a point in time in which he was writing the Left Business Observer, just this dinky newsletter that only the most autistic of socialists subscribe to. Um, and, and, you know. He, he uh, uh, and, and from this I was born, you know, in a way. And so maybe, maybe that'll be true uh, of some of you guys as well. So anyway, sound off in the comments. Uh, I'm going to try to do some more videos soon. Um, like, subscribe, hit the bell, do all that stuff. I'll see you later.